Welcome back. You're still watching Network Africa on Channels Television. Now, our leading story today is about that Islamist who gave that remarkable apology at the International Criminal Court in The Hague uh, for destroying a landmark, uh, for destroying uh, historic shrines uh, at the World Heritage Site in Timbuktu, Mali, back in 2012. Um, Ahmed Al Faki Al Madi was said to have said in court today, I'm really sorry, I'm really remorseful, and I regret all the damage that my actions have caused. Now, given his guilty plea, the trial will probably be over by the end of this week. Now, he faces a maximum of 30 years in jail. Dr. Onai Komo, who is a security expert, joins us now to examine his uh, plea and what could possibly happen to him. Doctor, thank you for joining us on Network Africa. Thank you very much, Amarachi. What do you make of Al Mahdi's apology? Does this sound sincere enough to you? Well, I think um, he, he's trying to probably save his skin. Uh, we have seen uh, other jihadists do this before. Uh, when they are in custody, they become a little more seen. But when they are out there uh, performing as if uh, there is no law in society, they, you know, they go out of uh, hand. Um, for example, the kind of crime he committed here, even though this is a first time for the International Criminal Court, uh, that is uh, uh, destroying uh, uh, property, and uh, not because they normally uh, prosecute people who killed, uh, that is genocide, uh, genocidal uh, authors, for example. Now, uh, this case, uh, this guy, he actually tried to destroy thousands and thousands of years of uh, Muslim history and uh, African tradition uh, by, uh, you know, leading uh, the charge in Timbuktu, where he incidentally grew up, got married, uh, a city where he grew up and got married and was very comfortable with. Uh, and when he became a Waha, an extreme Wahhabi. Uh, so I think uh, the problem here is when they are in the net, we've seen that even with Boko Haram here in Nigeria, when uh, Boko Haram fighters are uh, uh, ensnared or they've been captured, taken out of the battlefield, they start singing a different uh, a song and they start singing a song of appeasement and uh, of remorse. And that's what we are seeing here. It's very few of them we've really seen come out and, uh, you know, stand uh, and say, yes, defend their actions. Because it appears that when they are uh, carrying on their Wahhabi doctrines, they are in some kind of a trance, and uh, they are not themselves. So this um, uh, uh, apology by Ahmed Ahmadi is not uh, unusual at all for them. It really isn't, does it, sound, it really isn't un unusual. I mean, sorry, it does sound unusual because he's apologizing and then he's also advising his fellow, uh, uh, his, his colleagues in the, his fellow militants to not engage in acts uh, like this, just like he has. What do you think could have changed his mind over the period of time? Is it the fear of death, of eventual death, not in the hands of, you know, uh, an explosive, or in the hands of people he could consider infidels? We do seem to have lost a doctor. Yes, oh. uh, that, that's an interesting perspective, uh, Marachi. I think, um, uh, well, uh, I believe we all know that death is an inevitable end to all, but um, but having said that, having said that, it appears that um, uh, in this case, uh, you know, like I said, when they are in uh, custody, they become a little more thin, you know, uh, because it appears that uh, when they have this, um, when they have this jihadi going on, they lose their rationality. And that's what we're seeing uh, play out here. So now that he's in custody, he's going to face a uh, well, I, I guess the International Criminal Court doesn't have death penalty for destroying um, uh, relics and uh, uh, historical uh, archives. Now, uh, uh, let me also say one good thing, that it was actually the uh, wisdom of some uh, Malians who were about 90% of the uh, documents of, from the, those universities 
that we're able to save most of those and take them out to Bamako. If not, these uh, crazies will have destroyed everything mm -hmm. if they had access to them. So we also thank God for that. So I think the problem here is that uh, he knows that he's been caught. Uh, he's going to go in for very hard time. Uh, probably if they have jail violence, they might be killed, even by other jihadis. Uh, so, uh, I mean, for him, this is the end of the road. Uh, Doctor, what sort of reaction do you think that this could draw from other members of the group and from other militants and other terror groups around the world? I think this is really a very good uh, development because um, what this says is that, um, uh, look, what we are doing is really not right. No, no matter what we think when we are, you know, kind of uh, at the top of our game, it's not right. And it's probably going to give a change of heart to some of, uh, cause some of them to change their hearts uh, in terms of uh, the kind of extremism. Because we all know that uh, this extremism is not bothering anyone any good. Uh, it's uh, creating a lot of turmoil in society. It's, um, it's also destroying their cause because they don't have uh, people who are truly, uh, uh, you know, supportive of their cause. In their, aside from their hardcore fighters, are put in there by... You imagine a situation where you are... Uh, look at what happened in Cameroon, a 12 uh, or even a year old uh, detonating a, a bomb to kill 64. So, you know, they are getting a lot of people by brainwashing, by coercion, mostly coercion. And uh, so their rap is not, is not being bought by a lot of people. So I think uh, we're going to see a time very soon, within the next five years, where uh, this uh, radical jihad, uh, people are going to understand that, look, it's not going to take us anywhere. And, uh, and it, it, once they start losing that um, support from other jihadists, then, of course, so, uh, they, you know, they will, their fighters will thin out, and then eventually they will let their cause go. Mm. If we were to bring this home, Doctor, uh, Boko Haram recently released that video that uh, we saw last week um, asking for negotiations with the federal government. Can we trust such a request right now? Um, and what should the government do about it? Um, I believe I'm actually, and I have spoken several times about this. I will not trust Boko Haram with anything. They have uh, cut throats. They are ignoble uh, fellows. They are dishonorable. Uh, you can only trust someone who you know their word means something. So uh, I get worried when I hear that, oh, the federal government is trying to do prisoner swap with Boko Haram. It's not going to work, no matter you know what you said. Look, Boko Haram is already able to release a lot of his uh, fighters from custody. Now, at least they did a lot of that under uh, President Jonathan. Now, here, they are not being successful. Perhaps that's why they are saying this. But look, they don't have... All they want to do is increase their fighter population. They want to have uh, more uh, fighters out there to perpetrate their hyenas acts. So it's not like uh, they are, you know, they are being uh, nice and, uh, you know, having a change of heart and they want these guys to come back and reform. If they want uh, cooperation, if they want hands with the federal government to end terrorism in Nigeria, then let them lay down their arms and come out, give their terms of surrender, and ask for safe passage, and uh, what have you. But look at just these past seven days, we've had almost a daily attack of Boko Haram, killing, burning villages. Uh, they just burned shower on Sunday, that's yesterday. They bought another village uh, uh, two days ago, killed six, yeah. took uh, 13 women away. Now, why Doctor, are they kidnapping women Doctor, to go and cook and sleep with them if uh, they are uh, Doctor, you know, uh, blinking and uh, Doctor, putting down their Dr. Komo, weapons, Dr. Komo you thank know? you. Thank you so much for joining us to, uh, on Network Africa today. Appreciate your your passion and uh, your explanation on uh, many of the issues we've discussed today. Thank you so much. Now, still ahead, it is a race against time in a refugee camp in Uganda to speed up contributions for humanitarian response. Do join us again.